Ek het eindelijk gehoop sy gaan sing vir ons. Uh, dames en heren, please be seated. It is absolutely wonderful to have another inaugural lecture with real people in the room. Not a two-dimensional, but a three-dimensional event. And uh, it's really my privilege to welcome everybody who is here this evening, as well as the people who are online. You are also most welcome to um, join us this afternoon. So my name is Vikas van Niekerk. I'm currently the Dean of Engineering here at Stellenbosch University. And it's my voorrecht om u hier welkom te heet, en um, dat ons allemaal saam kan luister na die intree rede van ons hoogleraar, um, professor Tinus Boysen. Dis die, dis die mooi naam vir professor by Stellenbosch, is hoogleraar. I don't know exactly what that is in English, so we just call it. So it, it is also important that we acknowledge all our distinguished guests that we have here in the room, and also who are online, and firstly, of course, it's always an honor to have our Deputy Vice-Chancellor Social Impact Transformation and Personnel, Professor Nico Koopman here. So, Nico, you are nearly close to becoming an honorary engineer, so please come again and again, because we clearly are, we are educating you through all these inaugural lectures as well. But thank you very much for being here, and we're really privileged that you make time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. Um, dan het ons ook in die gehoor uh, een van die vorige, vorige dekane, wel, vorige, vorige, vorige dekane, professor P.W. van der Wald en sy vrou Elijn P.W. Heb jy gesien toe jy ingekom het? Ek sien jy nou dadelijk raak nie, maar welkom, daar sê, daar is P.W. P.W., welkom, jy so by ons, baie blij jy is terug. Um, then we also have um, Dr. Marco Gagiano online, and he is the Chief Transformation and strategy officer of MTN. And why it's important for us to have him here um, is that MTN has for many, many years sponsored the research activities um, of Professor Boysen. So, um, Dr. Hachiano, thank you very much for making time available to be here. We also have online the CEO of Daimler South Africa, um, Mr. Mark Reiner. Um, Mr. Reiner, welcome um, as well. En dan hier in die gehoor het ons meneer Gideon Neetling, en Mr. Neetling is the Chief Technical Officer of Golden Arrow Bus Services. So, welkom by ons hier so. Dan natuurlijk die mense wat die hardste gewerk het aan hierdie, aan hierdie um, loopbaan tot nou toe, en daar ook baie van die, van die, van die vreugdes en ook die, die teleerstellings hanteer het, um, is um, Professor Boysense vrou, En dit is professor Ronel Burger. So Ronel, um, welkom hier so. As ook die, die twee dochters, Hanna en Kara. So uh, Hanna en Kara, baie welkom dat jylle hier so is. En uh, jylle, jylle hoef hier stil te sit nie. Ok, so as jylle wil, as jylle wil, wil, wil vroetel, mag jylle vroetel. Jylle is meer as welkom om te vroetel. Um, and then we are also honored to have two sets of parents of Professor Boysen here. So the one is Miss um, Noreen and Mr. Tinus Boysen, and then also Miss Lydia and Dr. Kuni Berger. So both of you are very welcome, and we also know that uh, you supported him over many years. And then lastly, a general welcome to all the friends, the collaborators from academia and industry, the students, um, and quite a number of colleagues, both from the home department and also other departments in the Faculty of Engineering. And then, of course, again, all the guests who are attending online. So, everybody, you are most welcome here, and we trust that you will enjoy with us the inaugural lecture of Professor Boysen. Now, I also have to introduce to Professor Boysen to you as well. So, Tinas Boysen is a professor in the Faculty of Engineering, and is also the chair of the Internet of Things. And hopefully during the course of this afternoon, you will learn more about the Internet of Things um, in the faculty. He has been with Stellenbosch University from 2009, and he conducts research on the Internet of Things with a focus on smart energy, water and vehicles, specifically its application to paratransit in sub-Saharan Africa. And I'm sure we're also going to be enlightened a little bit on what paratransit actually means. He's also a founder of Bridget, 
um, which is a short for Bridget, Bridge to the Internet of Things, um, which is a successful spin-off company of Stellenbosch University, another one called GreenX Engineering, and he's the co-creator of Gizi and Count Dropula. He's the leader of the MTN Mobile Intelligence Lab and a partner in the Stellenbosch Smart Mobility Lab. He's a senior member of what we call the IEEE, or and the correct name for that is the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. He's a member of the Institution of Engineering Technology. He's a chartered engineer with the UK Engineering um, Council, which is like a professional engineer in the UK, but he's then also registered as a professional engineer with the Engineering Council of South Africa. He has over 10 years of international industry experience in the aerospace and automotive industry with companies that include Sunspace, Rolls-Royce, Boeing, BMW, and Jaguar Land Rover. He has supervised more than 30 postgraduate students, and he has published more than 40 articles in journals and over 50 articles in conference proceedings. So I think you will all agree that's quite an impressive um, record as, as a researcher, and we are really honored, Tinas, to be here this evening and to have you as our colleague and now also as a full professor, but it's been a while that you've been a full professor. We're struggling to have these events, and we are all here in anticipation for a very infor informative and, I believe, entertaining lecture. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Van Niekerk. Um, I promise, even though I'm now a work leader, I am not work as I stand here in front of you. I am mostly sober and uh, have full control of my faculties. So, um, thanks very much uh, for that. Thank you for attending tonight. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> to, to understand my research, you have to unfortunately understand a few things about me, and you have to understand something about the journey of how I got to where I am today. So I'm going to take you on a brief tour, so please indulge me. Um, the first thing is I really love learning. There's very few things that I love as much as just acquiring knowledge, and as most young engineers, I have also broken many things when I was younger, disassembled things to try to figure out how they work and what's going on inside. Sometimes I even tried to reassemble them, and sometimes that actually worked. Um, so the other thing is I am a son of a teacher, and I think anybody who is a, a child of a teacher will know what that means. I love teaching, even though my two kids won't necessarily agree that that's a good thing. Um, it's something that really defines me. Uh, another thing that defines me is that I love to help people. Uh, I think as most engineers do, I love to solve problems. I love to find problems, get stuck into them, and make things just better. Um, what is lovely about my current job is that all these things come together with a pretty handsome monthly salary, uh, which means that I'm doing a job that I love very much most of the time. From a young age, and this is where it gets a bit personal, so just bear with me for a, a bit. From a very young age, my, person, my, my parents impressed on us the idea and the notion that we are incredibly privileged. We, to start with, we had two steady incomes. Even though they were not extremely high, we had two incomes. My parents continuously reminded us that what we had was not a right, not a privilege, but that we were really just very fortunate and lucky to have what we have and that we shouldn't take anything for granted. They reminded us of the many people who had fewer than we had, and also the many people who had much bigger struggles than we had. And I think this was an eye-opening experience for me from a very young age, uh, to which it's something that we as a society has become desensitized to. So I think it's important to just keep that in mind. To my parents' credit, they actually did this before Mandela was released, so that's a good thing. Although my dad and my mum had to leave for work very early in the morning, often before 7 o'clock, they returned every evening um, to our safe and comfortable house, and they were both sober, cheerful, and on time for us to have dinner together. So until the age of about 16, I was mostly drifting. I was really not well-rooted. And then with a lot of effort from my parents um, and, uh, I guess, a labor of love, and with the help of three of my teachers who put me back on my feet, I, um, I really found my route again. These teachers were my science, maths, 
and computer science teachers, Suki van Sale, Teresa Bais, and also Trudy Duplessis, two of whom are online at the moment. And these people unwittingly laid the foundation for what, turned out to, what would turn out to be um, the, the foundation for a career in engineering. All right, so in the following whistle-stop tour, I will whisk you through my research on water, energy, schools, minibus taxis, and computer vision. When I started at the university, everybody told me, just focus, focus, focus. Don't, <laughs> don't, distra don't get distracted. But as Vikas and Herman will attest to, um, I don't deal well with authority, so I didn't follow, <laughs> I didn't follow that ad advice, as you will see. So along the way, I will mention some of the gifted collaborators and students I've been privileged to work uh, with on these projects. And as much as the lecture is about my technical research, it shows how my research career is inextricably linked to these people that I will mention. Um, and us not just working, but working together to a common goal. Finally, I will conclude, and just check you are seeing the right slide. Yes, I will conclude with uh, the damage that the 2020-2021 lockdown had on our engineering students. So I'll, I'll do a few uh, comments there. And then as Vikas also said, I just want to acknowledge at this point that the, the majority of what I'm about to show you is actually, and the majority of the students who are here are funded by MTN. It's important to note that. Okay. So let's, I was told to stand behind this screen, okay? So I want to move about, but I'm not allowed to. Let's start with energy and water, or as a bigger grouping, utilities. Only our colleagues from abroad will be surprised that our electrical grid, or ESCOM, um, cannot meet the demand, and we are therefore suffering rolling blackouts or load shedding. And this is just to prevent the grid from collapsing. The problem that we face is one of load, in other words, kilowatts, instantaneous power draw if you want, but also one of aggregate energy, so the total amount of energy that's necessary through the roll of a day, or in other words, kilowatt hour. The problem was actually predicted um, from the 90s, and since April 2008, it became a reality where we had this load shedding. So to compound the issue, our electricity generation is dependent on coal, which means that every kilowatt hour of energy generated results in almost a kilogram worth of CO2 that's global warming, or at least that's climate, that's causing climate change, and that is also uh, something that we have to live with and breathe in. And that only mentions CO2, none of the other noxious uh, gases. And this may be adding to some of our other problems that I'll touch on in a second. Uh, for example, severe water scarcity and recurring droughts. So in 2017, 2018, Cape Town faced uh, the so-called drought of a century, and I'll speak to that a bit later, but we came very close to day zero when our taps would run dry. And as you know, also, Gebera or Port Elizabeth is in a very similar position at the moment. So I'm saying that just to contextualize the challenges that we have. So I want to introduce you to three Internet of Things devices that we developed here at Stellenbosch University in the last few years, and that really found that, that uh, make up the foundation of the stuff that I'll talk to you about. The first is the Gizi, and this is our homegrown smart electric water heater controller, and it controls and monitors electricity, water, um, and a few other things like temperature, etc. Then its youngest sibling, uh, sibling, you can see in the middle, is Count Dropula, and this is just uh, a smart meter that measures water flow uh, at a high frequency and high resolution. And then finally, there's the What's On, uh, which is done in collaboration with Bridget, and this measures electricity usage, again, high frequency and high resolution. There are quite a few other stuff that we've built, devices that we've built, including vehicle trackers, driver behavior monitors, um, spectrophotometers, etc. and I'll touch on this a bit later, but these three make up the main bits of the research that I'm going to show you. Okay, so let's, let's go for electric water heaters first. We call them geysers in South Africa, and most of the rest of the world means something completely different. Um, in 2012, one of the colleagues who are here, Martin Weiss, or uh, Master Jedi as we're supposed to call him, he introduced me to the world of smart control of water heaters or geysers. And this was with the aim of doing energy management and also load management, preventing the grid from collapsing basically. Uh, because of the capacity of water heaters to store thermal energy, 
and because the high power burden that they put on the grid, they were fingered as a very good potential application for Internet of Things from the beginning years. It's just an easy thing that's very dumb, uh, easy to control, and very dumb at the moment. So from 2014, um, based on that introduction, we built our own Gizi. And this Gizi was part of quite a few students' uh, master's degrees. So I'm just going to tell you who. It was part of Philip Nell, Jonathan Brown, Andrew Kluten, Niku Nordia, Matthias Toma, and local Leona's master's degrees. So all of these projects work together to, in the end, give birth to the Gizi. In 2015, I was walking around trying to find a solution, or at least find a problem for this solution that we created. And um, Martin Fisser, who's here as well from UCT, introduced me to a guy called Jay Bagwan, and he's from the Water Research Council. It was fantastic how quickly Jay just latched onto the idea and identified all the possible, the possible opportunities for this thing. And he funded us to roll out 200 of these water heaters, uh, heater controllers in Mpumalanga. So in order to do effective management of water heaters, four things need to be taken into account. The first thing is user satisfaction. Primarily, that's what the water heater is supposed to deliver, hot water. Also, total energy used, so just how much energy does it use in a day. Total load on the grid at any moment. And then also health concerns. So the health concerns is about bacterial growth in the water heaters. And those four uh, powers pull in different directions. To achieve the balance while at the same time processing the flood of information that can come from 500, sorry, 5 million of these devices in the country. We don't have 5 million, but there are 5 million water heaters in the country. In order to be able to process those, you need a computationally efficient model to process the data, make decisions, and then roll out command and control of these water heaters. Another factor that's important to know is um, the orientation of these devices is important. I'll tell you why. Uh, the factors that, or the determinants that influence water heater control is really stuff that includes uh, the inlet temperature of the water, how much energy is lost to the environment through conduction, uh, thermal losses basically, also um, what temperature the water leaves the tank, and the volume of water that is drawn through the tank. So, the last factor, and I'll come to that in the next slide, the last factor that's very important is the buoyancy in the tank. So within the tank, water stratifies, hotter water goes to the top, colder water goes to the bottom. And that means that the orientation of the tank is crucially important because the buoyancy has a different effect on horizontal water heaters than on vertically orientated water heaters. What is strange about this is the majority of developing countries, I'm gonna rephrase that, most developing, no, many developing countries have water heaters that are horizontally oriented, and developed countries have vertically orientated tanks, which means if, if you go and look at literature, there are tons of models with which to model vertical water heaters, but almost none to do horizontal water heaters. So in 2016, Philip Nell, myself, and Brink van der Merwe developed the first water heater model that caters for horizontally oriented water heaters. What we also did, because of the South African scenario, we had to cater for load shedding, which means there's a period of two hours where this thing doesn't have power, but then also the strange habit in South Africa of turning off the, on and off the geyser to save, to save energy. So we made provision for those as well in our model. That model then spun off into fantastically uh, controlled algorithms, which was published with Mark Appley from New Zealand and Mark Rue in 2018, in which we took everything into account and ensured that all those three powers of balance uh, were in balance. Since we expected the, the, water to be, the water heater to be colder at the bottom and therefore concerned about Legionella growth, uh, we also did a few experiments on that. So uh, one of my close collaborators, Wendy Stone and I, went to Plum Guarantee here in Stellenbosch, and they allowed us to cut open a few water heaters that were decommissioned. On top of that, we also took samples from currently running water heaters, just hot water samples, and we tested all of those for Legionella. Uh, we published the results with Turby Lowe, who did some of the CFD analyses, and Martin Nivot, um, and the results showed that every single water heater we tested had Legionella in it. All right, so just like my children, users in the real world do not submit to controlled environments. <laughs> and I think this is, for me, a, 
uh, a matter of, of passion and uh, something that I believe in. Whatever we do must reflect the real world. It doesn't help much if we do research that's out there, not usable, and doesn't mean anything. So, as my students and my colleagues can attest, we absolutely strive to generate answers for real-world problems. And in that vein, um, Yapi Engelbrach, who's unfortunately not here tonight, and our PhD student, Michael Ritchie, uh, developed a model through which we can emulate actual users. So the first thing we did was to build a probabilistic usage model using actual water heaters from the Mpumalanga study and a few in, in Cape Town as well, build a proper usage model, and then we, um, we expanded that model to also include a mixer, for example, so that the user draws exactly the right amount of energy from the water heater and not just the right amount of water. This was actually proposed by Andrew Kluter, one of the master's students initially. All right, so... Um, in the same spirit of testing the validity of our results, we also questioned whether we really knew what was going on inside the water heater, because our model was fairly simplistic. It was based on a two-node model with very simple uh, nodes, one top, one bottom. The difficult question is, do we really understand what's going on inside this horizontal water heater? So what we did was we tasked one of our mechatronic students who became an E&E &E student. Um, he graded up. We asked him to build a controlled environment for a water heater. So this is drawing from some of my experience with uh, the satellite industry and the aircraft industry. We built a complete controlled box, and this box controls the temperature inside, or sorry, around the water heater, and we also have um, something that controls the temperature of the water that goes into the water heater. So basically a big freezer, truth be told, and a secondary water heater that heats and colds the water before it comes into the water heater. And this whole controlled environment also, also includes a mixer valve that's automatically adjusted at the back to um, allow actual usage profiles to run. And as part of that, as you can see on the screen, um, we also installed 67 temperature sensors inside this strange pressurized high, high temperature vessel to see what's going on inside. The results, which Daniel uh, van Skalkweek, Jaapie, and I published in April 2022, uh, revealed a fascin fascinating world of buoyancy, thermal conduction, and vortices, hitherto unimagined. The next step will be to, de to develop a state space estimation model for the water heater, and then also to allow machine learning to have a go at trying to improve this model. Okay, now we're changing gear for the first time. We're moving from energy to another passion of mine, which is water. As you all know, 2020, 17 and 18, Cape Town faced this existential crisis, and it now feels like a distant memory, of course. Um, because of my neuroticism, and because I subscribe to the world according to our local bitter bowl, John Matham, the radio presenter, um, I goaded my team into action the moment that we thought the dam levels were dropping and as anxiety mounted. So if... So what we, what we did was we took some of the geyser controllers and we converted them into dropular controllers, basically measuring water with them. And we installed these in Mpumalanga and also in Cape Town. This gave us a fantastic vantage point from where or from which we were able to observe changes in behavior both in an area not affected by drought and an area affected by drought. And we were able to compare hot and cold water usages. And we could do this to a resolution in most cases up to a minute which is pretty useful. So we could see the consumption changed as water restrictions were imposed, as politicians dithered and damage controlled, and also as the media sensationalized and compare the impact of those three. Renel, Martin, and I uh, published a paper in 2020, and we, we also looked at the monthly municipal bills for the whole of Cape Town to compare our results with and we looked at some panic metrics from Twitter and from other social media websites. And we found that our sample group did not respond at all, or very little, to the restrictions, but they did respond to the panicky fallout from the government's disaster plan and resulting media frenzy. You'll recall they said we're gonna queue for water at water tanks, and the military or the police were gonna escort us. That really made the big, biggest difference. So as you can see, from that study, we were able to, to show clearly what the benefits are of smart metering 
when you're trying to deal with a natural drought. Very useful. So what we then did was um, Cheryl and Rapunda and I took some of these measurements and we tried to establish at two specific points during the drought what time of the day did people change their behavior? In what way did people change at the beginning of the drought and the end of the drought? And what we found is that in the beginning of the drought, people changed their behavior mostly in the early mornings and in the evenings, and it was cold water and hot water, which means that people really reduced the showers, their showers and their baths, um, affecting their behavior to, to, or at least dropping their behavior in water usage. Then what we did at the secondary stage, this was towards the end where it was really starting to get very dire, um, we looked at that inflection point, and what we found is at that point, the behavior dropped in the middle of the day. And because our sample set was really of people of affluence, they weren't really at home during the middle of the day, which leads one to conclude that what happened was towards the end, it became so desperate that people actually involved their domestic workers and the cleaning that goes on in the middle of the day which is an important lesson to take forward for the, next, uh, for the next drought, which is sure to come. We need to take everybody on board, include everybody, not just the occupants on the house, but people who also work in the households or in the houses. Okay, now we take another gear change. Moving on to schools. And if I upset you with what I'm going to say now, I do apologize, but I say what I want to say. Um, so... Having had a very good education myself, and I'm going to read this, by the way, because I think it's very important. Being aware of what it has done for me, I find the South African educational landscape absolutely distressing. It kills me that the divide is so big that many of the privileged are unaware, uh, or they do not acknowledge the squalor and the brokenness of our poor schools. I believe at the post-mortem, in hindsight, primary education will be fingered as the worst failure of the development project in South Africa, both before and after apartheid. The advocacy work done in this domain makes Sir Faas van den Berg and Nick Spall, two of our university and our country's most important researchers, no less than living heroes in my eyes. My engineering background does not give me a direct avenue to the improvement of education, but there was one need in the education ecosystem that I could help with, and that is infrastructure like water and electricity and bills. We started by looking at the building sizes and the infrastructure at schools. The photo so shows six schools. The top three primary schools, the bottom three are secondary or high schools. If you go from the left to the right, it goes from quintile five, quintile four, quintile two or one. So it basically goes affluent, middle, and then poor. As you can see on the left, we have swimming pools, tennis courts, green astroturfs, and playing fields. To the right, we see smaller and smaller properties with buildings occupying more and more of the available space. Schools on the left, average number of children, 650. Schools on the right, average children, 1,300. All six of these schools are less than five kilometers from where I stand right now. So we're not talking rural, we're talking right here. Okay. Now we took the schools, after looking at the infrastructure and the uh, disparate positions they're in, we looked at how these schools compared in terms of water consumption. So Dropula, we used our Count Dropula water meter, and it gave us a treasure trove of time-based um, information. We broke that into up, up into hourly segments, which allowed us to look at water usage during school hours and water usage during the midnight hours when there wasn't anybody supposed to be at the school. The upper plots, oh, I'm, yeah, the upper plots, the three upper plots show the hourly flow per school, and the bottom ones show the hourly flow per pupil. With an unfortunate um, coincidence, uh, the one is sorted from Poor, the top one is sorted from poor on the left to affluent on the right, and the bottom one is poor on the right and affluent or rich on the left. It is striking how much more, wa more water the poor schools use than what the affluent schools use. This is obviously a maintenance and uh, a skills problem, but I'll get to that in a second. 
Um, the difference is starker yet if you consider only the midnight hours. So I don't know if you can see on the screen, but the midnight hours are shown on the right-hand side there. And that is literally when no water is supposed to flow. Any water that flows during those hours is firstly water that's wasted, but it's also money down the drain. These losses are especially um, prevalent in schools with large and old infrastructure that they cannot manage. So I'll, I'll, I'll say this right here. The, the, the schools that struggle the most are actually the Quintal 4 schools who used to be Model C or whites only schools. And they are landed with these big infrastructure and big buildings but they're extremely dependent on poor parents contributing. And I can tell you during COVID, parents stopped contributing because they couldn't anymore. Um, and these schools just can't maintain their maintenance or do the maintenance. But the failure is a consequence of skills, accountability, and awareness rather than budgetary constraints. My understanding, and I'm talking under correction, my understanding is that principals can apply to use their maintenance budget for other things, to plug other holes if they need to, which means the maintenance just deteriorates, deteriorates, and at some point infrastructure fails, and then central government has to come in and um, fix things at a very high cost. Uh, so in 2019 and 2021, Ashanta Gonetilke, Budi Vigiseri, Sherilyn, Stefan Gerber, and I published on this topic and the sad thing is, I have not seen any evidence of improvement. I'm not sure if I am expect to. During the drought, so this is back to the drought, but still on schools, um, we teamed up with Cape Talk, ShopRite, the Western Cape Education Department, UCT, in other words, Martin's team, Bridget, and our Innovus, uh, which is our Innovus spin-off, to run a water savings campaign at 350 schools. We were delighted that 93 corporates I uh, signed up to sponsor two things, a maintenance campaign and a behavior change campaign. So this, the project was essentially run by Yuri, who's here. No, he's not here. Uh, sorry, Heinrich, Philip, Jackie, and Arnu, most of whom are here, and also Loku. In the first phase, th this is important to get the numbers, so I'm going to repeat this. The first phase, we spent 5,000 rand per school. Just imagine how expensive infrastructure at a school is. We spent 5,000, only 5,000 at a school, doing stupid things like replacing valves, um, fixing taps that were leaking, etc. The results showed, which we published with Cheryl and Martin, they showed the average reduction in midnight flow, so this is flow during the evening hours, was 28% after the maintenance. Just to, just to put that into context, um, the median school paid off that investment of 5,000 Rand within five weeks, most of the schools in much quicker time. Um, so it's really, it's, it's a no-brainer to do it. At a later stage, Stefan and I then analyzed this two years later, just looking at what the midnight flow was two years later. And the sad result is that only the affluent schools were able to continue their savings. The poor schools just slid back slowly by slowly by slowly until they were back to where they started. Then what we also did with the rest of the um, support from the corporates with Martin's team at UCT, uh, we did a behavioral study. And in this behavioral study, we had three groups. The first group was a control group. They received no information, so they were left in the dark. The second group was a group that received um, emails and I think it was SMS messages. And they were also given access to an online platform to see their usage. And the third group was the same as that, but they also took part in a competition. So we just tried to measure what the impact of that was, and the results showed that the groups that were in the behavioral change groups uh, changed their usage by 15 to 26 percent, um, as shown as the, uh, the, the paper I published with Martine and her team at UCT. The project was such a success that Marion Edmonds, who is also here, I think, um, actually put the story on CNN. So thanks for that, Marion. So next we moved on to school electricity, but all that talk of water has made me thirsty. We moved on to electricity. We investigated the energy footprint um, of schools with support of Stellenbosch and municipality. Although we expected a difference between the affluent and the poor schools, um, we were surprised by its magnitude. Jason Samuels, who's also here tonight, in his publication with Sarki Groblar, also here, and me 
found a yawning gap between the affluent and the poor schools. So this is basically the haves and the have-nots. The median quintile five primary school, rich school, uh, uses 427 units of electricity a day, 427. The median quintile one, two, four school, so by far the majority of schools in the country, used a mere 173, less than half as much. Now you may think this is fantastic, the poor schools are extremely energy efficient, but in fact, this is purely a lack of infrastructure investment. They basically just have less. And as I said earlier, one of the big outliers, outliers are these Model C schools that are now quintile four schools, dependent on poor parents, and they can't really afford to, um, to upgrade. So what was really shocking is um, we found that lighting was responsible for 40% of the electricity used at these schools. In one singular school, just around the corner, a single floodlight was responsible for 7% of their energy bill. We also compared our school's usage with energy densities um, of schools in other countries, and you can see there's a box plot on the screen there. Um, our affluent schools have energy densities only 13% as much as the schools in North America, which is partially driven by climate, obviously, but then our poor schools have energy densities of only 5% as much as those in America. So it's, a, a world, it's worlds apart. So because we found that 40% of the electricity uh, bill go into lighting, we started looking at lighting at schools. We established that most schools were still using old fluorescent tubes, unlike the ones in this building. And given the large contribution of lighting, the cost saving of just flipping over to efficient LED lights are substantial, to say nothing about the energy and the CO2 um, savings. So Jason ran some experiments and predicted that a poor school would save approximately 27% on its electricity bill if the, we just helped them upgrade their lights. So Dr. Leslie van Roy, who I think is also here tonight, um, he was also very quick to, to latch onto this idea and he is the university's division for social impact. I think he's a, some form of a director. Um, <laughs> quickly grasped the, the huge potential, and he funded the replacement of local schools in poor areas. So that was fantastic. And fortunately, Jason is not someone who allows grass to grow under his feet. Um, in a matter of weeks, he had secured additional funding from Sali Abrams and from Gerrit Kutsia's team at the Western Cape Ed Education Department, and they upped the number of schools to 25 schools. So we replaced lights at 25 schools in and around Stellenbosch and Paul, and we had a lot of support, support from Orbit X, um, France I think is also here, and uh, Mario Ruiz uh, from Lightech. The savings were enormous. Um, some of the bills reduced by 39% in a matter of a day. Just replace the lights 39% down. Subsequently, we spun off GreenX Energy with Anita Nell and the Innovis team um, with a tech transfer office. And currently, Jason is working at GreenX and installing smart meters and replacing lights at um, quite a few Western Cape Education Department schools. We're also in advanced discussion with the Department of Basic Education nationally to take this into the other provinces as well. We're not stopping there though. Currently Rita, who is also here, Rita van der Walt, um, Sarki and I are busy with a sensing system in which we will measure air quality, light quality, and a few other things, temperatures, and um, in, in various classrooms, in Stellenbosch in the area, and then at the same time, Terumba, Michael Ahile, and Jason and I are developing a digital twins for schools, twin for schools to allow uh, decision makers and policy makers to make better de decisions about where to spend money and what the benefits would be. All right, so now we're taking a completely left turn. Um, this is one of my other distractions, and that's paratransit. Or like Dr. Vikas or Professor Vikas van Ikerk said, paratransit. It doesn't mean that we're mo mobilizing paras at all. <laughs> One of the many things that stayed with me when Renelle and I returned from the UK and later New Zealand was the confidence with which you could expect to survive a simple road trip in those countries. Another was the efficiency of the public transport. Getting places was safe, reliable and relatively efficient, although it was pretty rigid. 
So, while I was struggling with my PhD corrections, most people have to do those, um, a decade ago, I got distracted and I took a sneak peek at paratransit, at the local ill-understood, disorganized public transport system, to see whether there are opportunities to improve it. My fascination with informal public transport was immediately piqued, and we started investigating two things, driver behavior and safety. The minibus ta taxi sector um, operates somewhere between public transport and obviously private transport, but in America it's known as paratransit. So in academ the academic literature, we refer to it as paratransit. And you may not know this, us as a privileged few may not know this, but the majority of people in South Africa are actually moved with paratransit every day. They don't use private vehicles, they don't even use buses. Minibus taxis carry uh, almost 70% of people both in South Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa daily, which makes it criminal that not more effort goes into the, into the sector. Anyway, the other side is, uh, sorry, the, the, um, this civil society response to an apartheid government that was not very supportive of moving people has unfortunately become quite uncivil. It's notorious for violence, unsafe driving, and inefficiencies. But the other side is also true. It's agile, it's demand responsive, it gives jobs. There are 200,000 minibus taxis in the country, and they serve the poor with more enthusiasm and vigor than any government has done yet. It's a flipped coin. Um, a breakthrough for us was when we received a little bit of funding from the Dean of Research at that point, which was Willy Perold, and 10 tracking devices from Catherine, um, Catherine Lewis from Mixed Telematics. And those trackers, which we installed at 500 Rand a pop, which we gave the, the owner, um, ran for two years. And for every single minute of those two years, we could see where the taxi was going, what they were doing, and it really it opened up a whole fascinating world for us and provided a wealth of material for interesting, at least to me, uh, research. And I think at this point it's important to also say it's, it's amazing how the active participation of key people at crucial times can open doors um, for, to unforeseen opportunities. Right, so the first thing we looked at was minibus taxi safety. You may not real, realize this, um, but especially again in this room, when you're fast asleep on a Friday evening, many people who hail from there are in minibus taxis driving to the Eastern Cape. So they leave at roughly nine o'clock in the afternoon and they depart on this grid track and they're back on a Monday morning before they have to start work again. And this is typically undertaken for funerals, weddings, and other cultural or religious ceremonies. This is a 2,400 kilometer journey done in 56 hours, typically with one driver. Yeah. And in Easter, it's just to and fro all the time as well uh, with Christmas. But worse than that, sorry, the, the minibus taxis are allowed to drive at speeds at 100 kilometer per hour in South Africa. That's the speed limit. They can't go, shouldn't go beyond it. We recorded average speeds exceeding that for every single leg of the journey to the Eastern Cape. Worse than that, we actually re recorded them exceeding the 120 kilometer reading for most of the journeys to the Eastern Cape and back. We evaluated then, so I don't know if you know, but the area there around Aberdeen has an average speed over distance track or sector where they measure the average speed over distance. So we then tried to un understand their behavior over that area and tried to understand what was going on, why were they speeding? And we found that the drivers purely just did not understand the speed limit. They thought it was an instantaneous camera just doing a speed snap. And we could prove this if you look at the screen there, that little red circle there indicates 300 meters around the camera. So they would just stop and then gun again. They didn't understand average speed. And this really speaks again to our education system and the consequences of people not being well educated. So to try to influence their behavior, we installed what is called auditory speed adaptation. In plain English, it's a very loud buzzer. And this buzzer goes off as soon as the driver goes above a certain speed limit. In the first stage, what we did was to set the buzzer fairly low so the driver could turn it, tune it down or tune it out with just turning up the radio. But 
In the second stage, we make it, made it so loud that they just couldn't ignore it. It was very loud, and all the passengers could hear it as well. And what we managed to do is bring down the speeding frequency, in other words, how many of the samples they were speeding, from 81% to 60% in a matter of a weekend. After we disabled the buzzers, um, the frequency returned to 71, which is obviously better than the 81, but I'm assuming that it went back up again afterwards. Publications with Adrian Zeman and Nelson Ebot Enu Akpa, who I believe is also here, try to say that, and Marion Sinclair and Johan Anderson brought us into close contact with this alternative, weird transport world. For one strange thing, my lily white student, Afrikaans speaking Adrian, if you know him, you'll know what I mean when I say white, he's really pale, um, and he's unlicensed, he ended up driving a minibus taxi on the N1 when the driver was tired. Driver turned around and said, I'm tired, who's taking over? And Adrian drove the minibus taxi. So unfortunately, again, we had zero impact on policy. And as a researcher, that really stings. It's difficult to, to admit that. We were unsuc unsuccessful in securing further funding for this important line of research. Um, so we dropped it. Um, and then just a, a weird, interesting factoid that I think really puts the cherry on the cake. The quantum minibus taxi that we use in South Africa is based on an international version called the High Ace. That High Ace can only drive 135 kilometers an hour. Then they revamped it for South Africa. The South African version, the quantum, 175 kilometers an hour. So you have to ask yourself, yeah, despite our inseparable fates on our shared potholed roads, it, it appears that the lives of the poor don't matter enough for the authorities to take notice. In addition to safe to be also evaluated the minibus taxi's efficiencies. The work was mostly spearheaded by my PhD student, Innocent Ndibacha from Uganda, um, and we used, again, tracking devices to characterize the mobility patterns of these minibus taxis in the very busy and congested city of Kampala. Innes, uh, Innocent. Innocent and I were the first to measure and quantify the holdback period, because in Western literature it doesn't exist. And this is when a taxi stops, and for no other reason than just waiting for passengers to fill up the van, is held back. So this hold back thing is something that we introduced, um, and it's very common to African passengers. We broke further ground by recording the taxi movement, and um, Susanna and John, you are here, you'll find this interesting. Uh, we found that the minibus taxi drivers behave in a way that is called a levy flight, and that levy flight is something that's used to describe the behavioral pattern of insects or other foraging animals when they're looking for food. So it's, it's literally as if these drivers are hunting for passengers. Little did Innocent and I know, we were actually laying the foundation for further research into uh, the decarbonization of paratransit. In 2018, uh, Ronel and I took a sabbatical. We went to Waikato, Uni sorry, I should say that properly, Waikato University in New Zealand, where Mark Apperley and I discussed the sustainable electrification of transport in Africa. We roped in Kevin Buresh to do the heavy lifting, as lecturers usually do. We looked at the potential for saving the grid by offering solar photovoltaic charging points at larger employers, like the university, um, for at-work charging. Then in 2020, we were joined by a mechatronic student from East London, Chris Abram. He joined our team, and he worked on the electrification of the paratransit system. And supervised by me and Arnold Rix, he developed a simulation platform that includes mobility model, electric vehicle model, and also renewable solar generation that could be used by anybody out there. We established the energy needs of urban taxis and also the impact that would result on the grid. Since then, Chris has published three groundbreaking papers and a book chapter, this is in a matter of a year and a half, um, on the electrification of minibus taxis in various sub-Saharan cities. I forgot to mention when I spoke about the geezers, Michael Ritchie published seven papers in two years, which was just mind-blowing. Um, with support from Larissa Fusel and um, Thomas Berendt, sorry, it's Berendt Thomas, from Reutlingen University, we also evaluate the impact of wind power and stationary battery storage to help support the grid for these minibus taxis. All these efforts won us a World Bank contract recently um, in, in a consortium led by Simon Sadier from Transitec and Oxford University. In this project, we affect 
we, we assessed the effect of decarbonization a fleet of minibus taxis in Johannesburg. Um, the effect on the vehicles, the effect on the local electricity network, the grid, like switchgear and transformers, but also um, the taxi ranks, electrical infrastructure, and the national grid. Again, as I said earlier, we want to do research that's true. We don't want to just pluck things out of the sky. So we began to question the validity of the simulation models that we drew from literature, and we went ahead and we put um, five field workers into minibus taxis here in Stellenbosch, doing different routes to try to characterize the micro-mobility energy impact of these vehicles. Um, I can't say too much because it's not yet published, uh, but I can tell you that the people working on it is Johan Gilumier, and uh, he's also here, and I'm working with Chris Hull, Catherine Collette, and Malcolm McCulloch at Oxford University. I hope you can see that all of these are really collaborative projects, and I feel without that, uh, it's really difficult to make progress. All right. So, um, what we evaluated was the publicly available data sets, and we quickly established, so just so you know, uh, data in Africa is extremely scarce. There's a few public available data sets that people publish, and then everybody is dependent on those. So we try to use some of those public data sets to try to establish the electrical demand, and because we had data from Kampala, we were able to overlay the two and to compare them. And our results clearly show, if you look at the, um, the left-hand graph there, that the the data that we got from passengers, passengers getting in the taxi and tracking the vehicle, is missing a lot of the data that you would have captured if they had GPS trackers built into the vehicles. So I think the big lesson we're taking from this is passenger data is not adequate for electrical assessments, and also uh, GPS tracking is crucial. The main reason is GPS trackers don't do human hours. They don't stay up or they don't get up late, they don't get off the taxi for lunch, they don't go home early, they stay with a taxi, come what may. Um, the other graph that I just want to show you real quick is the impact of these minibus taxis on the grid. Um, the light gray line there, I'm going to take some water first. The light gray line there is the, the, the average power drawn from the vehicle battery, and then the dark line there is the energy drawn from the grid. So what you should be able to see very quickly is that the evening peak that we expect from minibus taxis perfectly coincides with ESCOM's biggest headache, the evening peak from household water use, or at least household electricity usage. Um, in the middle of the day, we should be able to cover that with solar, but it is crucial, it is absolutely crucial that, first of all, every electric vehicle that is brought into the country must be matched by some form of electricity generation and on top of that, we really need to think about limited charging. All the simulations we did broke the grid. And we used 22 kilowatt chargers. The chargers that come out in America at the moment can go as high as 150 kilowatts. If we allow the taxis to charge however, whenever they want, if we allow any vehicles to charge whenever and however they want, we're going to be uh, sat with a very big problem. All right, so that's the story. The formal stuff gone. I couldn't, I couldn't get myself to drop these from the presentation, but they don't fit in anywhere else. So I'm just going to run you through them real quick. Computer vision is an area of research that I've been um, involved with. Uh, a few of my colleagues uh, and I have looked at a few things. And um, the term computer vision just means the capture and processing of images to extract useful information. So the first project, uh, project I just want to quickly highlight is uh, the one detecting potholes. So Steve Kruen and Sonja Nienalber and I published a data set um, with potholes. We sent Sonja up to Gauteng to get thousands of potholes, pictures of them, and to then annotate them. Uh, I can tell you it didn't take her very long to find <laughs> a thousand potholes. But since then, our data set has been downloaded 17,000 times. So kudos for, where are you, Steve? for Steve for telling me to make this thing open source. And that's really why I feel quite passionate about making things open source. People have obviously used this and um, published on it. Second, uh, you may not know this, but I'm going to use crass terms just because these are the terms that we use. Um, people with black faces. 
have an issue with facial detection. Facial detection doesn't work as well with highly pigmented individuals. Partially because the training data is biased, because all the development's done in America, Europe, China. Um, so that's the one problem. But the secondary problem is black faces just don't... Uh, I forgot the English now. Reflect, thank you. Reflect as much light. Uh, so what we've done is to build an infrared-based solution that uses the full spectrum, both visual and infrared. To, and we went into Stellenbosch Taxi Rank, took thousands of pictures of people, trained the, 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 the neural nets, and we found that we could increase the uh, accuracy from 97 odd to 99% um, by doing that. The third project I just want to mention real quick, we developed and published a vehicle-based number plate recognition solution, which the intention is basically to turn every vehicle into a set of eyes that just does number plate recognition all the time, which means that you have indirect a tracking system. And this was published with um, Arnu Barnard and with Martin Rademeyer. Fourth, this is with Toby, who is also here. We used mobile phone cameras, um, and then specifically the ultraviolet, ultraviolet spectrum with a scintillator to build a spectrophotometer. And this thing measures the levels of nitrates in water so that you have a mo mobile water quality sensor. Finally, we also built a uh, automated pedestrian counting system using Sunroll's uh, existing cameras. Okay, we're getting to the end, so just bear with me. Um, I want to briefly also mention a few new exciting projects that we're just starting to work now. We don't, we don't have publications on it yet. The first one, you must have heard, uh, yeah. So first one is on conductive ink. So we developed a smart nappy, Francois Schneider and Toby Cronier, and, uh, Toby Cronier, Toby Lowe and I, uh, developed a smart nappy, which allows you to first of all measure a baby's breathing and also the baby's heart rate. So this is with pr printed, it's printed on the nappy, it's conductive ink. Um, and then also we've expanded it now to also be able to detect the sugar levels of the baby. So you can do early detection of diabetes or you can look for malnutrition in either infants or in uh, elderly people. The um, second one that I'm extremely excited about is as part of my new chair uh, in the Internet of Things, and this is the development of a smart greenhouse solution. Um, so we're building smart tunnels, uh, and we're doing this with Keegan Hall and Arne Boeta, and this is in collaboration with our partners from AgriScience, uh, Dave Drew, Ethel Piri, Kim Martin, and Mosima Mabitsela. I know they're also here. The third is a cashless payment system for minibus taxis. So this runs on USSD. So rather than getting in a taxi, having to run an app, or getting into a taxi and having to dish out cash, you just get into the taxi and USSD the ID number of the taxi, and it gives you the options of where this taxi is going to, and you can draw from a virtual MTN, if I can do that, uh, MTN wallet. Um, the alternative is also we've built a telegram payment system. So you get into the taxi and do the same through a telegram messenger, and obviously we can do the same with WhatsApp as well. And this was developed by Kudzai Tenderere, Kitso Motlola, and Lauren Fasahi, who's also here, and me. Fourth is a synthesizer for household electricity that Jason Avenant and Michael Ritchie are developing with me, Yapi, and Arnold Rex. And this will allow us to do large-scale planning of rollout of solar power, uh, demand management, and then also uh, just understanding what the impact on the grid is of certain uh, demand management strategies. Okay, so this is, this is, I think this is the final slide, so we're almost there. Despite all that evidence of research progress, the years 2020 and 2021 were devastating for faculty, staff, and students, and I think broader than that, the world. Because of the lockdowns, we were subjected to teaching in mute, into muted cameras late at night and early in the hours of the morning. When I first started teaching at Stellenbosch 2009, I stuck a piece of paper on my wall that read, Ki due letswa hubaruta, which roughly translated, Ethel, are you here? What does that mean? Okay, it means I am paid to teach. Okay, I wanted to remind myself, because my wife is a researcher, I had a very good idea of the priorities of research. I'm paid to teach, that's what I was here for. Although I've shown you a lot of my research, my real passion is actually to teach. 
I do research to teach. Not being able to engage with the students directly was tough for me. However, I believe that what we had to face as lecturers was nothing compared to what the students, especially the engineering students who are already stressed, had to face. And I still see it every day. Every day I meet with students who are struggling. Um, in 2021, Karen Wolf, who's also here, and Nikki Korsten and I conducted a survey to identify their, the students' sources of stress and the coping strategies that they employed. As expected, the student says the worst thing for them was writing exams, doing practical assessments, and then writing reports. Many reported feeling overwhelmed and struggling with the pace and work workload, but that's nothing new. Then they reported this was especially bad during em emergency remote teaching, which we can all uh, relate to. Most worrying was the apparent change from first year to fourth year cohorts, from what I personally, this is my opinion, consider to be less healthy to, uh, sorry, more healthy to less healthy coping mechanisms. If you see the increase in things like, I'm not going to say this on the camera, but yeah, you can see the left hand six or so things increased as the cohorts got older. I'm happy to report that the Dean Vickers and the Vice Deans and the Heads of Department viewed our findings seriously and they've already taken remedial actions and supportive steps um, where appropriate. So thank you for you. I want to fin finish with this. It's important that we don't forget it is after all the students that we are here for. And that's me. Thank you. Professor Van Niekerk, Vice Deans, colleagues, students, friends, family and parents and parents-in-law of Prof. Tinnis, wife of Prof. Boesen, Prof. Ronel Berger, children of Prof. Boesen, if you are still, they are sweet, sitting there. <laughs> Hannah and Kara. Tinnis, it is such an honor and pleasure to participate in this great moment in your life and in the life of the university. So, colleague Tinnis, congratulations to you. We share in your joy. Another round of applause for you. <laughs> so, to keep to the time, I'll stick to the manuscript, Tinnis. And that is the disadvantage of limited eye contact. I must tell a teacher this. The inaugural address of a full professor is a moment of celebration and also a moment where we can reflect afresh upon what universities are for. Collectinus, you will henceforth, as a full professor, profess, to say it in Afrikaans, KWV, Kennis, Baardes en Vaardighede. You will profess as a full professor knowledge, values, and skills. You're in the caveat fear business. <laughs> your lecture tonight demonstrates that your knowledge and research impacts on the learning and teaching of your faculty. Your love for teaching is reflected clearly in the highly accessibility, the high accessibility of your lecture. It further demonstrates that your knowledge impacts transformatively and in humanizing and dignifying manner on different spheres of society on grassroots level, from water to energy to schools to potholes to taxis, etc. <laughs> we could also sense the values that you stand for and that you transmit. We taste the SU values of e-care in your work and person E-care stands for excellence, compassion, accountability, respect, and equity. We are colleagues in the company of excellence tonight. You would agree with me. We witness to a professor of compassion, which is reflected in Tinas's deliberate efforts with other colleagues and students to address the health and well-being challenges of 
our students during pandemic time. The same compassion, Tinas, is seen in your concern about the plights of schools in our countries and schools under our noses. Even your analysis of taxis and a weekend trip to the Eastern Cape shows compassion and concern. You demonstrate the value of accountability and responsibility by so clearly giving account of what you are doing and by exercising responsible scholarship. Your respect for marginalized people is clearly informing your research, your teaching, and your social impact. And your quest for equity for all humans and also for the natural environment is seen in your commitment from youth days to socioeconomic justice and ecological justice. And amongst many skills that you embody, the skill <coughs> of making science accessible to popular audiences as tonight, and the skill of marrying science and technology with the concrete challenges of society are skills to be transmitted to peers and students. Your teacher father, Mr. Tinas Boyson Sr., definitely impacted on you. In conclusion, your father-in-law, friend of mine, Dr. Kuni Berger, one of the top practical theologians and experts in homiletics, that's Preakinde, would agree that when we listen to a sermon or a speech, we ask, did it inform? Did it transform? Did it illuminate? Did it inspire? And lastly, did it bring delight? <laughs> I almost wanted to call it an EE -E speech, an EE -E lecture. Energizing and enthusiastic. Tinas, thanks for doing all of this tonight. In your inaugural lecture, as full professor in the Faculty of Engineering at Stellenbosch University. Thank you. I have the uh, pleasure to um, thank a number of people on behalf of uh, Tinas. I would call him Professor Boyson, but he really prefers us not to call him Professor. Um, so firstly, we want to thank um, Professor Nico Koopman for once again joining us at our inaugural lecture. I think we should just put a special request in that they should just send you to us every time. <laughs> and then um, Tinas wants to especially thank his wife, Runel, and his uh, two lovely children, Hannah and Cara, for their unwavering support and healthy distractions. Um, I'm assuming that includes some exercise as well. Um, and then his parents, Nareen, Tinas, Lydia, and Kuni, for their love and acceptance. Uh, and then especially uh, thanks to all the industry sponsors. Um, there's quite a list of it here. Uh, it's MTN, Mixed Telematics, ShopRite, ESCOM, the Water Research Council, Western Cape Education Department, Cape Talk, the World Bank, and the Department of Science and Innovation. And I'm certain there's quite a number of them which didn't make the list. Um, then Tinas wants to thank the foundation of his work, which is his collaborators from academic institutions, industry, and government. And I'm assuming this includes his students as well. And he wants to thank the many people who availed themselves as mentors um, on his long search for purpose and meaning, which I also believe is long, uh, long from being over. Uh, the last two uh, people he wants to thank is the administrative staff uh, because they make our lives easier and then the cleaners because they make our lives better. And then from uh, the engineering faculty we want to thank uh, corporate communications, especially Olivia Adams and Amira Brown for their arrangements that they made, for Justin Alberts uh, for the recording and live streaming of the lecture. Uh, for the coordinator publications, specifically Jonathan Dale Blankenberg, um, and then the Dean's Office, specifically Ulrich, Clint, and Jimmy, and Marley, for all the preparations to get the rights hall ready for tonight. Um, so to end off with, I, I want to invite everyone um, 
Well, there's actually one last thank you that I forgot. We, want, we must thank Tinas for a very, very interesting talk. I think, I think we can give him a round of applause. For that. Uh, so, so to end off, I just want to invite everyone for um, some uh, something to drink and something to eat. I don't think there's coffee fear, unfortunately, but there, <laughs> there's some other things to drink as well. So please join us um, uh, outside.